Good evening, UNC family and friends. Thank you for joining us at this virtual once again as we continue to hold the corrupt and dictatorial Rowley regime to account. They believe they have a get out of jail free card, but we will change that. We are not going to stop. We'll hold the Rowley PNM accountable for their crimes against the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Let me also say thank you to our previous speakers this evening for their very, very insightful contributions. Thank you all. Now, you recall in October, we started our People's Revolution in response to the Rowley regime's dangerous dictatorial policies. This is a revolution against a failing health system. This is a revolution against a galloping dictatorship. This is a revolution against joblessness and hopelessness. This is a revolution against property tax. This is a revolution against so much that is wrong under the Rowley PNM. Our revolution now continues as a people's revolution, and it has just begun. We will not stop until democracy is rebuilt and restored. I want to talk a bit about the PNM's COVID propaganda team. They too must be held to account, and they too must go. Since the state of emergency was declared, we have experienced among the highest death rates in the entire world, yet in the whole world. And our ICUs were reported by some doctors as to have an almost 100% death rate in May and June. However, the PNM felt they had a get out of jail free card and did not have to account for this shocking death rate, which could be, and seen by some, as premeditated state sanctioned murder. Why do I say that? I say it because no one has been held accountable. This team of propagandists have just kept on congratulating themselves. Ease and the death rates have um, been shooting up, I think it's now about uh, 1,772 deaths. One death too many. Remember, I call for changes when there were only about 250 deaths. So since then, over 1,500 more persons have died, and no one is being held to account. They saw nothing wrong with what was happening. They kept blaming citizens. They kept blaming victims. Can you imagine that? How perverse, how bold-faced of them. The Prime Minister already contracted COVID. He had to be quarantined on at least two occasions. You know, recently, you remember, he bonked on somebody with his golf cart. That lady, poor lady, and we share, we have our sympathies with her, this lady was one who was found to be COVID positive, but Prime Minister refused to isolate himself. Yet he hypocritically boasts citizens about behaving irresponsibly, irresponsibly, when he may be the most irresponsible person in the entire country. Indeed, for the past few weeks, we've seen a dramatic rise again in the number of COVID-19 patients admitted to our ICU and high dependency units. And I ask again, why is it that almost two years have gone by of this pandemic and we are still hearing about our ICUs being at breaking point? Why after $20 billion spent on COVID relief, there are only 52 ICU beds for 1.5 million people? Why? Why? Billions for Warner. Takuri and others, the besties of the Prime Minister, the finances of the Prime Minister. But I'll save that for another night when we can talk about these persons closely associated with uh, Mr. Rowley. So I ask now, why only 32, 52 ICU beds? Is it that we have to wait until one of Faris's family or a PNM financier starts making ICU beds and resources so that dictator Rowley and one Tia Dial Singh will give ordinary citizens the health care they deserve? What does this failed health team have to say about that? Who is holding them to account for this deadly disaster? They are arrogant. They feel themselves above scrutiny. And the CMO is more concerned about posing for pictures while he oversees the basic, biggest medical disaster in our country's history. He too must be held to account along with the medical team. Tonight, I want to tell you that news has reached that there is one person on this puppet propaganda team who is already in advanced talks to run on the PNM 
platform for the seat of St. Joseph at the next general election. A birdie has whispered at us, and I won't call any names, you know why? But she knows who she is, and that is why she will praise dictator Rowley, no matter how many of our citizens die. These people are corrupt to their core. This is why we call for a commission of inquiry into these deaths, and we still maintain that call. We need to know why so many of our people are dying in the ICUs and the HDUs. This call is now part of the people's revolution to hold this wicked government with their enablers to account. No more secrets, no more cover-ups. I ask also which PNM family, which friends, which financiers have been making a killing with quarantine facilities, medical supplies, and whatever other rackets they have devised to steal our money while innocent citizens get buffed, lose their incomes, and some regrettably die. And, you know, recently you saw that the PNM shut down the parliamentary debate. No accountability on their part. At the beginning of October, Dictator Rowley shut down the debate on the budget. You remember that? Because they didn't want to account for the billions of dollars that have unaccountably gone to family, friends, and financiers under their corrupt regime. Two weeks later, after the opposition filed a historic Section 36 motion to get answers to serious questions over the missing Police Service Commission merit list, the debate was blocked in the Parliament. All this was done to cover their tracks over Dictator Rowley's alleged political interference in the selection of a Commission of Police and the collapse of the Police Service Commission. But we have refused to be silenced. We refuse to give Rowley, Wontia Diaz Singh, Credit Card Camille, Faris al Reclusal, and the list goes on, a whole cast of villains. We refuse to give them a get out of jail free card. We will hold them to account and rebuild our democracy in Trinidad and Tobago. So October, we say, is over, but the people's revolution has only just begun. The UNC will not stop fighting this oppressive PNM regime led by dictator Raleigh. He madly believes he's a king and the rest of us are merely his servants at his beck and call. All across our nation, we see people peacefully taking a stand against this blatant erosion of our democracy. We have met with civil society groups. We have mobilized independent voices to join with ours in the people's revolution. In the coming weeks, the UNC will continue to focus on the corruption and discrimination taking place under this PNM dictatorship. We will continue to meet with stakeholders from various sectors, NGOs and civil society groups in order that the voices of the people can be heard. I want to tell Dictator Rowley tonight that his corrupt regime will not be able to recuse itself from being accountable to the people of our nation. Rowley, I know you think the Constitution is like a golf course. You feel you can ride roughshod over it and knock down who you want to and get away with it. But tonight, I serve notice the UNC and the people of this country will fight you politically until the end and until our democracy is rebuilt and restored. And let me now talk to you a bit about making independent centers accountable too. I have taken note of Senator Vera's private motion against the conduct of all opposition senators, all of them. Can you believe that? I find this motion to be frivolous, vexatious, baseless, and without any parliamentary merit. This center failed to identify a single standing order or law that was violated by the opposition during the attempted debate of our Section 36 motion to hold Her Excellency to account with respect to the fiasco concerning the Police Service, Service Commission. Senator Vera is clearly now acting as a pawn in Rowley's anti-democratic playbook within our parliament. I want to remind you, Honorary Senator, no one voted for you. You were handpicked by a president who was handpicked by the PNM. She has failed to answer serious questions on breaching the constitution and is now hiding from the public. And now you move this motion to try and silence the voices of the elected opposition. May I remind you that we were elected by over 309,000 persons. We are their voices in the parliament and outside the parliament. What exactly makes Senator Vera or Paul Richards outstanding? 
how unfair, unjust, unaccountable, and undemocratic can you get? If we go further and look at your record, your voting record in the parliament, in the Senate, this 12th parliament uh, since the elections and you were, um, you were appointed by the president, we will see clearly that your votes uh, show a reflection of yourselves as being nothing more than Rowley's rubber stamps. In the 12th parliament, Richard has never voted against the PNM. Take note. Many votes are taken in the parliament, but if they do not go to a division, you don't know how any particular person voted. So let us look at it. Richard has never once, Senator Richards, never once voted against the PNM. Never once. Out of 16 occasions, Senator Richards has always voted with the government, in favor of the government, 16 times. Out of 16 occasions, Vera has voted with the PNM 15 times. On 16 occasions, Cherise Sipasad has voted with the PNM 15 times. Out of 16 occasions, Varma Diasing has voted with the PNM 14 times. Out of uh, 16 occasions, Senator Hazel Thompson Hai has voted with the PNM 14 times. Out of 16 occasions, Senator Amrita Dehrein has voted with the PNM 13 times. They voted against these PNM puppets. They voted against procurement legislation for the gutting of the procurement legislation. They voted in favor of the property tax. They voted to preserve Harris's flawed COP selection order, which eventually went to court and parts of which were struck down. And you know, this voting pattern is in contrast to opposition motions where the so-called independents have not supported these motions as they have done in support or in favor of government motions and bills. Significantly, on one occasion, when Senator Mark brought a, a, a motion to annul the uh, Police Service Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner's Election Process Order 2021, where Faris introduced law that we said was bad law, notably in that debate, every single so-called independent senator voted against the opposition's motion to annul that order, and in that way they voted in favor of the government. As you know, parts of this order was eventually struck down by the court, proving that the opposition was right in its objections. So where were the independent centers, I ask you, when the constitution and independent offices, such as the same order I mentioned, the 2021 police commissioner order, needed them to stand up and defend? They were voting in line with the PNM. We in the opposition, I tell you, will not be distracted or deterred by Senator Vera's baseless, frivolous, vexatious, and without merit motion that he has filed in the parliament. And I make the point again, if you had an objection, you could have done it when the matters were taking place in the parliament. You didn't raise a single voice. You walked out of the parliamentary chamber and started to attack the opposition for doing our job, which is to defend the democracy and the people of Trinidad and Tobago. On that fateful day, when we were in the parliament debating the section 36 motion, you raised not a single objection to anything that was said and done in the parliament. And that was the place where you had the opportunity to raise objections under any standing order, under any law, or under any parliamentary procedure. You fail and are neglected so to do. And yet, you seek to come on the back foot, you come after everything has happened, to raise, as I say, a frivolous, vexatious, baseless motion in the Senate. So where were you then? I ask again. When serious matters came up for debate in the parliament, and you continue to vote in favor of the government. Where were your voices then? Inside the parliament, outside the parliament, you were silenced as PNM pawns. We cannot count, I say in this country, on eat or food independent, so-called independent senators to represent citizens of our country. They clearly do not. They're there representing themselves, the president and the PNM government. So we have to see them for what they are. Yes, there was a tradition in the good old days when you had centers like Easton McKenzie, Senator Martin Daly, so many very distinguished sons and daughters of our soil. They were there, they conducted themselves with the decorum befitting of the offices they held. That has changed when you chose to go down into the political guile and therefore we will engage you in that political guile, senators in the 
supposedly independent bench. And remember, in our constitution, there's nothing like an independent senator. There's nothing called an independent senator. They hand picks of the president, the men and women of the president's wrong table. There is nothing known as an independent senator. And now you have shown clearly that you are not independent and you're merely echoing and carrying through the bidding of the PNM government. I said this must be changed in our own ongoing process of constitutional reform, which we began when we were in office, we began. We had set up an high committee with Hamid Ghani, uh, then MP Prakash Ramadan, Minister of Legal Affairs, and many others. Um, we had a team going across the length and breadth of the country. We had begun that process, process of uh, consultations for constitutional reform, and this is something which certainly must be continued. When we look at what's happening in our country, I talk about accountability again. And the president has lost all moral grounds to continue to put forward names for the police service commission. I've said it before, and I repeat it, and I'm still of that respectful view. The president must also be held to account. The president has no moral authority, as I say, to bring new commissioners' names to the parliament until she comes clean about the mess and crisis created with the last commission. She must be held to account. This is the demand of the People's Revolution. This is how we rebuild democracy in Trinidad and Tobago. Her Excellency, by refusing to account to the public, has turned the office of the president into a sub-office of Balijay House. It is truly a shame that even the highest office of the land was unable to withstand the tampering by an interference by the PNM. Madam President, I again call upon you to come clean to the people, account to the people and answer the questions still hanging over your head. The country deserves answers, Madam. We live in a democracy, Madam, not a monarchy. And whilst all of that has happened, that fiasco, that debacle, what has happened? The result has been a leaderless TTPS and surges in crime, in the crime rates, escalating crime. The president has not accounted to the people of TNT, and until she does so, the process for that must be paused. There are real questions that still need answers. One, why did the president first say she received a merit list from the Police Service Commission, but then said a list was submitted, and then what? Withdrawn. Withdrawn. Have you ever heard of anything in the law whereby law a list is submitted and then it was withdrawn? Which law did you follow? A clear breach of the Constitution. Who withdrew this list and why? On whose instructions was the list withdrawn? Why did the entire Police Service Commission resign in chaos? Why was Rowley writing to the Police Service Commission last year to say that he had lost confidence in Gary Griffith? On what constitutional authority did the President return the merit list to the former Chairman Bliss Sipasad? And by the way, where is the list Bliss? Where is that list? That list is alive. It was done when you were subsisting as a live legal commission. On what constitutional authority did the President return the merit list, as I say, to Chairman Bliss? We call upon them both. Where is the list? Why did the President not disclose this information to the court? Certainly as a former court of appeal judge, the madam would know the rules of full disclosure, yet failed to place before the court, through her attorneys, any information about this list and a withdrawal of this list. Why did the president breach section 123, subsection 4 of the Constitution, when she failed to forward to the parliament the merit list for commission of police um, to parliament to be uh, considered by the Parliament as is mandated by our Constitution. Who was the unnamed high public official mentioned in Roger K. Singh's resignation letter who allegedly unlawfully interfered in the business of the, of the Police Service Commission at President's House, whether it be 11th or the 12th? And again, there are so many dates that do not add up. The maths not matching with those dates too. There are many different versions about events and dates when events transpired, we have to ask which version is true. So all of this has led to the alarming situation where the first time in our history, we do not have a police commissioner, we don't have an acting commissioner in place. And what is the result? What is the impact of this? We are seeing the impact of this where criminals are now emboldened to attack innocent citizens in their homes, in the public, anywhere and everywhere 
all with no accountability from government. Even the extended state of emergency did not put a dent in crime. Just this week, we learned of the very tragic circumstances surrounding the discovery of a missing woman, young Kizia Guerra, in a shallow grave. Our condolences go out to her and her loved ones, and to all those who have lost loved ones due to crime. The murder toll continues to climb on a daily basis, over 354, which clearly shows that this year, by the end of the year, we will have a higher murder count than last year. Other serious crimes are being reported, such as break-ins, robberies, assaults, etc. The Rowley PNM seems content with this situation, as such as there is no effective plan implemented or even be spoken about to reduce crime and create a safe environment for citizens. Let's talk about the state of emergency. And I've said the crime, no dent in crime uh, by virtue of the state of emergency. What was the effectiveness of it? On the topic of the state of emergency, Dictator Rowley, straight fresh out of the UK, announced he was considering, he was not considering at this time to ask the parliament to extend the SOE. He wants to appear like a benevolent dictator. No more SOE was the front page of one paper. PNM propagandists, an op oppressed population, were expressing gratitude as if dictator Rowley gave them a gift. This was no gift from Rowley. He is taken front. Dictator Rowley knows he cannot extend the SOE because he would need the approval of the opposition to do so, and we will never do so. To extend it, he will have to explain to you how the SOE, SOE supposedly work. We ask the question, did the SOE achieve its objectives? Did the rate of spread of COVID reduce or increase? Did vaccination rates increase? Have the target levels been achieved? And the answer to all these questions is no. No. Dictator Rowley knows he cannot justify extending the SOE, taking away people's constitutional and human rights, taking away their livelihoods, depriving them of their freedom. During this time, COVID got worse, not better. And we are had, as I said, amongst the highest death rate in the entire world. Rowley's state of emergency was a complete and utter failure, just like his government. And therefore, his government and he must be held to account for it. Again, speaking about accountability, Rowley must be held accountable for killing the energy sector. So this is yet another area where dictator Rowley must be held to account for the death of the energy sector. On Saturday night, we heard him all but admit that his administration has killed the energy sector. In a shameless display of utter incompetence, the Prime Minister admitted that Atlantic Train 1 is dead, saying that the doctor is putting on his coat right now. I say, Mr. Rowley, the only coat that needs to be <laughs> the only coat that you need to put on right now is to put you in a straight jacket and maybe send you straight up to St. Anne's. Dictator Rowley lied to us for months, saying negotiations were ongoing. He now admits to us that after his discussions, the gas for train one is simply not there. Rowley, do not take the people of this nation for fools. Stuart Young, Mark Luquan, Conrad Enel and yourself were well aware there never was any gas before you instructed NGC board to spend $440 million of taxpayers' money on a fake turnaround of Train 1. In addition, this NGC board lost $200 million on a failed compressor project. This PNM board, Conrad Enel, Kenneth Allen, Sean Balkissing, Sandra Fraser, Mark Loquan, Dan Martineau, of, um, I think he's with FCB, um, NCB Global Finance, another one of those interlocking directorates, um, Dan Martin or Howard Dutton, cost taxpayers of this country $650 million in losses. So don't get by fooled by the press conference on Saturday where Rowley is now saying it's only 33 US. Talk to us in TT dollars. We are in Trinidad. You know, you always buff people for talking about elsewhere. We are in Trinidad. Tell us in TT dollars. And this is about, as I said, $650 million. That is over half a billion dollars. Can you imagine that? In losses of your money, taxpayers' money. And what is it? No one, no one, no one has been held to account. 
Tonight I said this is beyond incompetent. This is criminal. You didn't need to go to the United Kingdom to talk to BP executives to learn there was no more gas for train one. Since 2019, you know, BP told this government in writing, not just orally, wrote to the government there will be no gas for train one in 2021. Dictator Rowley, recusal twin Stuart Young, Mark Loquan and others were warned there would be no gas from either BP or Shell long before this fiasco. Raul, if you wanted to go play golf with the BP executive, say so. But don't make it sound as if you went seeking a solution for Train 1, because BP repeatedly told you there was no gas for Train 1. Tonight I call upon you to fire all, all, all of the entire board of NGC and its president for their disregard, disrespect, and mismanagement of millions of taxpayers' dollars at a time when thousands of the same taxpayers are suffering. This NGC debacle was no mere mistake. It was an act of government trying to fool the population about train one while diverting funds to family, friends, and financiers. This is the hallmark of Rowley's dictatorship. Mismanagement, blunder, and plunder. And tonight I say, we call upon you Prime Minister and your Minister of Energy, your recusal twin Stuart Young, to tell us what was this money spent on? Who were the contractors that received this money, the 600 and whatever, 50 plus million dollars? Who are they? By what process was this money expended using taxpayers' dollars? I want you to remember, Dictator Rowley was willing to offer the NGC board an indemnity for spending millions of your dollars in this fake turnaround. Can you imagine that? The only reason an indemnity was sought was that every single one of them knew that train one was dead and there would be no turnaround to take place. I say again, this may amount to theft in broad daylight and we must not let them go with a get out of jail free card. They must be held accountable. Tonight on behalf of citizens, I say scrap any indemnity now. Take action against all those who authorize this expenditure of 650 million taxpayers dollars. No wonder the NGC has now been reduced to a struggling company that lost a billion dollars last year from a very profitable company under my watch to such a struggling company, losses of about a billion dollars last year. For months, we have asked you for accountability on train one, yet you persistently lied, telling us negotiations were at a sensitive stage when clearly they were not. That was all an attempt to cover up the pillaging of NGC under disguise of keeping train one going. We need to find out, as I said, where the money went. We need to recover it. We need to find out the trail of corruption which allowed this massive squandermania to occur. And whilst we, we call upon you in the energy sector for accountability, we also call upon you for accountability in terms of turning our economy around, restoring, rebuilding and restoring our economy. Where are your plans? You have absolutely no plans to turn around the economy, rejuvenate, to uh, create sustainable jobs for growth, none whatsoever. Your six game changers all failed miserably. Not one, the sandal scandal, the dry docking facilities, the drag and feel, you name them. All your pie in the sky promises have all failed. Typical PNM promises never materialize. So unlike you, Dictator Rowley, the UNC has been working on plans to move our country forward. We have presented plans time and time again for resilient recovery and growth, which included some of the following, reducing the tax burden. And this thing with the VAT, where you try to fool people again, that VAT will send prices down. Well, you see people looking at binoculars now in the supermarkets, in the groceries, to see which prices went down, because they can't find them. Prices have not gone down in spite of that little gimmick that you tried by saying you're reducing, taking the VAT off. And why? Because you put VAT on 7,000 food items that we had, you place VAT onto them and you expect prices to go down. And in addition to all your mismanagement of the economy, we talked about reducing the tax burden. We talked about jump-starting food security. And what happened to the $500 million allocated for agriculture to help the agricultural sector. What became of that money? Where did it go? Who benefited? The answer is no one. It was still sitting there when we did the last budget as allocated but not spent. 
The UNC has talked about restarting a reformed oil refinery to regain fuel security. What a shame. I think that has been the greatest shameless act in our history. In Trinidad and Tobago, when Rory blew out the flame at Petrotrain. When he fooled the workers and the country to say he's going to sell it to the workers. What has happened with that? Up to today, not a word about a plan to sell the refinery to OWT workers. All of that was election gimmicking, gimmickry to catch people to vote for you. And then after all the promises, PNM promises never materialize. The UNC has looked into and is talking about investing in renewable energy and recycling. For example, establishment of a solar energy park at Tamana, industrial recycling parks across the East West Corridor. And you know, that was something you could have gone up to Glasgow and talked about with respect to climate change, you know. These would have been real issues, real projects that could have been done in uh, reducing our carbon footprint whilst at the same time creating sustainable jobs and growth, sustainable growth. But no, instead, you dismantled the Ministry of the Environment and went up to Glasgow to talk about heaven knows what. We in the UNC have talked about and will be considering the creation of three innovative funds to mobilize financial resources, a national food security fund, very vital for rejuvenating, rebuilding, and uh, really pushing forward the agricultural sector in our country. We talked about national infrastructure fund. I mean, now we have to stop calling Trinidad and Tobago a banana republic. We are now a pothole republic. Infrastructure has really gone through the window. Um, I, I think you have more potholes than you have actual road services to dry, drive upon. UNC has considered a National Climate Trust Fund. Think about that. You went to Glasgow. If you had listened, I've shared this with you in the Parliament, outside the Parliament, a National Climate Trust Fund. You could have talked about that. And you do already have a fund which could have been converted into a National Climate Trust Fund. And that trust fund has to be the Green Fund. There was an article writing, it was this weekend about how much money in the Green Fund that we pay, taxpayers pay into the Green Fund. That money could have been leveraged and used for creating a National Climate Trust Fund. But no, no, you have no plans, you will listen to no one, you will seek no advice. And that is why under this Rowley regime, under this PNM dictatorship, we have to continue with the People's Revolution to hold them to account in order to bring growth and development safety and security to Trinidad and Tobago. I talked many moons ago about the fourth industrial revolution. I may have been of one of the few or the only politician many years ago in our parliament to speak about the fourth industrial revolution. And I recall when I used the word fourth industrial revolution, I saw one of the recusants lift up his head like that, like, what? Say what? Never, they never heard of it. I told you last week, that we are coming out of that fourth industrial revolution. Again, I'll be one of the first few people in this country in terms of political policy to talk about the fifth industrial revolution. And so that's where we are heading. It's a whole new generation, a whole new world that is waiting, waiting for us to become active participants for growth and for development and for education of our children to live in this whole new world of the fifth industrial revolution. So while Rory remains stuck in his outmoded thinking, the UNC recognizes that the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution can give our country a better chance to speed up the modernization of the economy. But further, we are now have to look to the fifth industrial revolution. It's being called Industry 5.0. If the COVID pandemic has taught us anything, it is that we must accelerate the adoption of new technologies not only in our everyday lives, but in business, in education, in government, in health, indeed in practically every sector of our country. We have already seen the rise of e-commerce, the digital delivery of education and new technology, and the development of life-saving vaccines. According to Oxford Economics, we are quickly moving from the fourth industrial revolution, which focuses on the use of artificial intelligence, big data, and the Internet of Things, to Industry 5.0. This embodies all these systems, but incorporates a greater human intelligence. Great advances have been made in this era, with organizations such as Neuralink working to create a brain-machine interface to help people with paralysis. Can you imagine that? A brain interface machine 
brain-machine interface to help people who are paralyzed. This is where we're going now. Not just into the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, big data, and so on. We are moving to things that are more related to genomes and have to do with human capacity, um, increasing human capacity, increase, increasing human health, human lifespans. A lot of fantastic research is taking place. And where, where, where are we in all of this? Where is Trinidad and Tobago in all of this? The digital age ushers in an era of high value, high efficiency, high productivity, with tremendous opportunities in entrepreneurship, that is, businesses, creativity, innovation, and job opportunities. Will Trinidad and Tobago be part of Industry 5.0? Not under Keith Rowley and the PNM. They are taking us back to the jungle and the Stone Age. In every, every area of life, they are failing us, they are dragging us down. But I assure you that we in the UNC, we will continue to do the groundwork and we must make sure not no one must, we must make sure that not one is left behind. This is a commitment I give you tonight, again, that we will continue to look for solutions. We will continue to look for ways to grow economy, to create jobs, and to push Trinidad, propel Trinidad to be able back in the front of the world. We were world leader, you know. If you look at that climate change conference, our Prime Minister talking to an empty hall. Why? But with this Prime Minister, wow, look at like chalk and cheese. We were there once. When I was Prime Minister, we co-chaired many of the climate change committees at those conferences. I can give you those details. Ronnie Charles knows them very well as a former a diplomat, and he's our shadow um, portfolio with respect to foreign affairs. But we, we were out front in the world. We were out front. When I spoke at the UN Convention, at the UN United Nations in um, 2014, which was the last time I went, I talked to, the, I talked to that conference about climate change and having responsible fiscal policies and measures in order for us to be at the forefront. There was one year when uh, one, a very struggling country, Nayur, I think is the name of it, Bronx, in that year when we, <laughs> you know, they, they co-sponsored some people from Trinidad and Tobago to pay for them to go to be part of the climate change conference that was happening because they were so badly, um, being badly damaged by, by, by those things. But this royal regime came in, as I said, what did you do for climate change? Dismantle the Ministry of the Environment. Dismantle the policy and programs. And then you come to repeat them. You talk about electric cars. How long have we been speaking about that? Every year you promise electric cars. And where is it? The only thing I see your Minister of Energy doing is going to open a gas station. Fossil fuel. Fossil fuel. There was a time when there was a minister in another government. He went to open a dustbin. I mean, it's so busy, you know, to turn key and cut ribbon. They cut a ribbon in Tobago recently for a Castara fishing facility, one that took years to build. Newspapers carried the reports, years to build. They said the scissors was bigger. They needed many persons <laughs> to hold the scissors. They said the ribbon was so big, oh gosh, they all had to grab it. But up to today, they can't say how much money was spent to build that. Again, corruption. Use of taxpayers' dollars. You want to tell me since 2017, 2018, you started to build that facility. Years later, you still cannot say, the Asia cannot tell the country how much was spent. Never mind, we'll do an FOIA and we will find out what you have done with taxpayers' dollars. So, you and see family and friends, and those are who are on listening on to us now, I want to thank you all very much for staying with us, for giving us that support. And I want to tell you that um, we, have, we have created a logo for the People's Re Revolution. That logo will show you that we are in darkness. We are in an eclipse. Trinidad Tobago is covered in darkness. And in every religion of the world, light is the way out of darkness. And so we have the eclipse with the light that is struggling and pushing forward to come out of that darkness. With your help, together we can do it. Together we can rebuild and restore democracy in Trinidad and Tobago. So we ask you to join us in the People's Revolution. It is not just for you or for me or for PNM and UNC. The People's Revolution is for our democracy. It is about our human rights and freedoms in a country that is built on a constitutional parliamentary democracy where our rights and freedoms are enshrined in our constitution. I want you to know there's much work to be done. We must keep up the fight. This is not about saving the future of our democracy, 
and preserving the future for our children. It's not just about that. This revolution is not simply, as I said, about UNC versus PNM. This revolution is about stopping a corrupt, rowdy dictatorship from converting our nation into the worst dictatorship you would have seen in our region. Let us continue our peaceful people's revolution for democracy and justice. Rowley behaves, behave, believes he can continue to do his deeds in the dark and get away. But as all the scriptures teach us, so too we say with our people's revolution, that we will shine a light on this dictatorial wicked government. They will see that they have no get out of jail free card and we will not stop. What they do in the dark will soon come to light. I ask you again to join us and remember, we thank you for your support. Remember you will have leaders and you would have had before me. You will have leaders after me, but I give you this commitment. I will stand side by side with you to fight with you and for you. I thank you and may God continue to bless you and to bless Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much.